This video topic was suggested by Chloe, a member of my Patreon community, so thank you to her for suggesting I make a video about it and for the sources she shared with me. Love will conquer all, said Lionel Richie, and he was not wrong, you know. The representation of unconventional forms of love have helped improve our understanding that love can transcend gender norms, class, uh, race, love can shift people's beliefs and opinions. That is undoubtedly what Matt Healy thought a few seconds before he decided to kiss a bandmate on a stage in a country with very strict anti-homosexuality laws. It is not the first time he does it though. In 2019, he had already kissed a male fan in Dubai, a country that is also known for anti-LGBTQ plus legislation. This time he told the crowd that he had made a mistake by agreeing to play in Malaysia. Quote, when we were booking shows, I wasn't looking into it. I don't see the fucking point of inviting the 1975 to a country and then telling us who we can have sex with. Local activists quickly denounced what looked like some white savior complex. Venus Darling, a Malaysian non-binary, said the incident served absolutely no one but Matt Haley. By doing what he did, he dragged my community into the spotlight when my country is still grappling with the resurgence of Islamic conservatism. Activist Heyman Harris Muhammad Hadid said that, quote, Healy's actions will bring about a vehement opposition from the majority of people who are still healing from their colonial trauma, unaware that their own bigotry is itself a colonial remnant. But it is not the first time that celebrities get a backlash after performing in countries with problematic legislation. In early 2023, Beyoncé was paid a reported $24 million to perform at the unofficial opening of luxury Dubai hotel Atlantis the Royal in front of an invitation on the audience of celebrities, influencers and journalists. Several months before that, she had released Renaissance, which was supposed to pay tribute to black queer culture. Many LGBTQ plus activists did not like it. But some fans said that, following this logic, Beyoncé shouldn't even perform in her home state, Texas, given that anti-LGBTQ plus legislation also exists over there. Finally, in 2015, Lady Gaga sang Imagine by John Lennon at the opening ceremony of the European Olympics in Azerbaijan. Her performance was seen as an endorsement of the authoritarian regime of Ilham Haidar Aliyev and his brutal human rights crackdown against Azerbaijani citizens. Now, Matty Healy did not only go and get the money, he also used that opportunity to share a pro-acceptance message, but by doing so, he reopened an unhealed wound and it backfired immediately. Healy's stunt comes only a few weeks before highly contested state elections in Malaysia, where conservative political forces are expected to gain seats. Healy's provocative white savior stance was automatically used by conservatives to legitimize their anti-LGBTQ plus agenda. And you know what's even worse than that? Well, the Malaysian anti-LGBTQ plus laws are a product of British colonial laws. Okay, so try to imagine how it must feel to have a careless British boy coming to a former colony and lecturing it regarding the very laws his country established centuries ago. Not good. What's funny about it in a way is that Hilly and the colonizers have something in common. They both believed that they were doing something that was right. Sure, the definition of what is civilized today would rather use the term uh, modern has changed. Back then, civilization, modernity was the nuclear family and a religious education. Now, it means recognizing and ensuring basic human rights. Back then, a majority of people thought that homosexuality was immoral and that it should also be the rule in all British colonies, colonies that often had looser norms. In Malaysia, for example, as early as the 15th century, we have records of Malay androgynous priests or Sida Sida who served in the palaces of sultans. The Sida Sida were typically male-bodied priests or courtiers who undertook androgynous behavior such as wearing women's clothes and likely engaged in sexual relationships with individuals of the same sex or both sexes. Westerners did not like that. The Indian Penal Code of 1960 was the first law to outlaw unnatural practices in the British colonies. It went on to serve as the model for anti-homosexuality laws throughout the Commonwealth. Of the 76 countries that criminalize sexuality, more than half do using the British colonial law. 
For example, Malaysia's archaic penal code says that, quote, whoever voluntarily commits carnal intercourse against the order of nature shall be punished with imprisonment for a term which may extend to 20 years and should also be liable to whipping. Now it's clear that the West does not approve of such laws anymore. Things really changed in the 20th century during which the defense of human rights became increasingly popular. As an example, the achievements of the feminist movement gave rise to the modern women, so women who was educated, who could vote, but had to remain desirable. That model became trendy, it was exported abroad because it signaled modernity. That was the case in China. The president of the First Republic, Chiang Kai-shek, and his wife, Suang Mei-ling, established a new life movement to counter the rise of communism. Song Mei-ling was close to American elites. She was the daughter of a wealthy businessman, an educated woman who regularly gave advice to uh, her husband, but never tried to elevate herself above the expectations of what a woman should be. Because of her looks, because of her beliefs, she embodied the model of the Western modern woman, a docile, educated and desirable woman. And she really wanted to spread that model all over China. But it didn't work exactly as planned, because of a movie. In 1935, Huang Lingyu played the role of a young woman who wanted to become a writer in a movie titled New Women. She naturally complied with Song's new Western-inspired woman ideal, as she believed it coincided with her desire to emancipate, that that was the way for her to become a writer. However, she soon realized that her life was rather limited. It wasn't more fulfilling than the life of her mother or grandmother because she had to comply with gendered norms and expectations. The modern woman is still alienated. The character Wei Ming will never become a writer. Faced with that depressing reality, she chose to end her life. The film was heavily criticized because it went against the values of the Chinese society President Chiang Kai-shek wanted to materialize, a society then partly inspired by Western's gender norms and religion. In fact, the actress Huang Wulingyu ended up taking away her life, just like her character. When that happened, 100,000 people gathered at the funerals. She became the symbol of a generation of women who wanted to be treated as equals and live their lives as they wished. Many of those women left to join the communist movement and experience something that was much closer to their vision of an equal society. The story of the rise of Suang Mei-ling and the resistance of progressives like Huang Lingyu is proof that the application of Western power's definition of modernity onto other countries won't necessarily translate into liberation. Only women who were part of the elites, like Mei-ling, could occasionally take on roles that were restricted to men. The rest of the country had to comply with conservative norms and therefore strict gender roles. In other words, the modernity of the West was primarily understood in terms of aesthetics. In fact, we could argue that even in the West, the modern woman was an aesthetic more than a reality since domesticity remained an essential part of women's lives. In other words, the women look modern, but they are not liberated. The aesthetic of modernity is immediately what comes to mind when I see this. This is Vogue Arabia's cover featuring Princess Aifa bint Abdullah Al Saud in her car. The photo was meant to celebrate the quote, trailblazing women of Saudi Arabia ahead of the lifting of a ban on women driving. End of the quote. The editor in chief, Manuel Arnaud, said that the magazine wanted to celebrate the exciting and progressive changes transforming the kingdom and that embodying this new era of female empowerment is Her Royal Highness Princess Aifa bint Abdullah El Saud. The problem is that the princess did not do anything to help lift the ban. Quite the contrary. The royal family has been accused of jailing the very female rights activists who for years fought for the right to drive. In fact, a year after the Vogue issue was published, the royal family imprisoned another Saudi princess, Princess Basma, who has been very critical of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and the state of women's rights in her country. So yeah, you can be vocal as a princess, but not too much. A Vogue cover is okay, but a series of targeted political attacks sends you to prison. Liberation is purely performative and further help the royal family strategy to appear less problematic to Western powers. So that's what Western activism looks like when it is applied abroad. I mean, it's a win-win situation, isn't it? On the one hand, the West continues to exert power, soft power to be more specific, over former colonies and the East in general. 
And on the other hand, Eastern elites adopt the aesthetic of human rights to gain legitimacy on the global scene. And in the meantime, local activists like Wajija El Hua. Oh, it's really hard. I'm gonna do it again. In the meantime, local activists like Wajiha Al Huwaida, Fozia Al Uyuni, Manal Al Sharif, who are responsible for the advances made, are silenced. They are put in prison, even. The Mati Hili situation is quite coherent with that. Hili went on stage, he did his own thing, without really considering what LGBTQ activists were already doing in Malaysia or how he could support them instead of doing what he did. He reproduced the top-down approach of human rights politics, one that is centered on the unity of the Western savior rather than the complexity of local communities. It's an approach that was established in the mid-20th century and reinforced in the later 20th century when Hillary Clinton famously said, women's rights are human rights. It was around the time the United Nations Human Rights Office of the High Commissioner was created. The defense of human rights became the West's most precious cause as it was proof that they still had an international role to play. They could continue to exert influence abroad through the defense of human rights. In Love Falls on Us, written by journalist Robbie Corey Boulet, Lambert, an African LGBTQ plus activist, says that, quote, support from international activists is most readily available when the chances for spectacle and for scoring political points are highest. End of the quote. The African activist interviewed for the book explained that international human rights discourse does not allow Africans to discuss the issue on their own terms, but instead to respond to what Westerners do and what they say. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, Hilly had already kissed a man on stage in 2019 in Dubai, another country with strict anti-homosexuality laws. And the media coverage of the event was so much nicer than this time. This time, the media outlets who talked positively about the whole event faced a pretty serious backlash. So things are changing very slowly, that's true, but people start to understand that activism isn't one-size-fits-all. In order to be effective, not just performative, activism has to take into account the specificities of each culture, each country. I think it's fair to say that localism is the way to go, and our job as Westerners is to raise awareness, um, to support local activists, to ask those with influence to speak up and choose their side. But our job is also to look at what works elsewhere and see how it can inspire our fights at home. Now, I've been dying to talk to you about Les Soulèvements de la Terre. It's a French climate activism movement that gathers, gathered, uh, it was dismantled by the government. It gathered dozens of organizations, including farmers, urban activists, anarchists, politicians, with people from all social backgrounds, except the super wealthy, and uh, of all generations. Its specificity is that it focused on key local actions, the Megabassin construction site at saint soline or the high-speed train line between Lyon and Turin. These two projects are really bad for the environment. And before someone asks in the comments, yes, the Lyon-Turin train line is detrimental for the environment because all the lines already exist and could be renovated and better used instead of financing this huge project. So those actions are very local and people say, you could say, that they won't change anything down the line, but it is wrong. In fact, we need more actions like that. We need more local actions to show that we're there, we'll protect the environment or whatever cause we're fighting for. We'll protect those cause everywhere necessary. So you see, there is no universal recipe, a program to be applied, or the same repetitive actions being done. Instead, the sort of activism done by Les Soulèvements de la Terre is adapted to its environment. It adapts to the people in that environment and it seeks to bring everyone involved around the table. And I know that it sounds like I'm only discovering what true activism is. I know it's not groundbreaking. This form of activism is very, very old. But I think that with the rise of slacktivism, performative activism, the influencer activists, virtue signaling, it is important to remind ourselves of the importance of localism. The importance to get out and touch grass and sabotage your local pipeline or slash SUV's tires. I'm joking, or maybe not. You'll never know. Anyway, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, the conversation continues in the comment section. Don't forget to like, to subscribe if it's not already done. As always, a big thank you to my patrons and a special thank to top tier patrons Joey Esguera, Ivan, Jason Ferguson, Rémi Cabal, Trebizond, 
Toki, Corrigi, Tristan Armitage, Patricia Ferrero, Christopher, Jan Donage, Edwin, Ren, Alex, Sam Robinson, Manuel Rego, Alexis, Perry, and the other patrons who prefer to stay anonymous as well. I always forget to thank them, but you're there. 